We've been talking a lot about immigration, and of course, immigration was the central part of American history up until about 1900 or so. We were, in fact, a nation of immigrants, and except for the American Indians, uh, who were themselves immigrants at one point, uh, everybody in America was an immigrant. Everybody had had experience of immigration. And so this was a very common f uh, subject for discussion. There was also a long history in certain parts of our country of what we call xenophobia, the hatred of somebody who is different or foreign. And this led to a profound streak in American history of uh, trying to limit the immigration of the people we don't want in our country. Uh, the immigration that we saw in the 1880s and 90s and early part of the 20th century brought this to a head. This was a new situation and uh, America was reaching a point of transition that it had never reached before. Now, what brought that about? Well, the first thing was we, we underestimate in our time the impact of all the changes that were going on in this country. But up until about 1890 or so, America was overwhelmingly an agrarian country. Farming, ranching, that was the key to America. And a lot of the mythology of America is Paul Bunyan type stuff with people out in the woods and people in the farms and a little house on the prairie and that kind of thing. But starting around the turn of the 20th century, America was becoming urbanized. And that shocked and scared a lot of people. This was a new phenomenon and they didn't like that. They didn't like it especially because the people who lived in cities were often immigrants who were very different than they were. And that was, that was a problem for them. The second thing that made a difference was a thesis put forward by a professor of history at the University of Wisconsin named Frederick Jackson Turner. Turner's thesis was that by 1890, the unlimited frontier where you could always go and it served as a safety valve for urban crowding and problems. People could always move to the West. Well, Turner said the West was filled. Now, he was wrong. The West wasn't filled. It isn't any more filled today than it was then. But he put that forward and people took that seriously and they were concerned. Where are we going to put all these immigrants? They're going to pile up on top of each other and they're going to cause terrible problems in our cities. <clears throat> the third thing is that immigration began to come from places other than Northwest Europe. Up until shortly after the Civil War, immigration had come from England, France, Germany, Switzerland, parts of Austria, parts of Western Poland, perhaps, and Scandinavia. Now immigrants were coming from different places. They were coming from the Mediterranean, Italy, Greece, and the Middle East. They were coming from Eastern Europe, from Poland, from the parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire that were farther east, from the Baltic States, and from Russia, and Romania. And they were coming from the Orient, Asians, especially toward the west part of our country, there was an influx of uh, Oriental workers in the railroads and in the cities. <clears throat> Let's add another factor. Up until 1877, reconstruction of the South held down some of the negative sentiments. There was anger and resentment among Southerners that the North had won the war and now was imposing its concept of how the, the government and the states ought to be run. But with the election of 1876 and thereafter, Reconstruction was over and the North pulled out 
and the South began to reassert itself. And they began to reassert itself themselves uh, by saying, we don't want all of these foreign people in our area. Uh, they also uh, found that they were being bypassed by economics and industrial development in the North. As the railroads developed, it was no longer necessary to use waterways for transportation. The waterways ran east and west in the south and north and south in the north. But now you could go anywhere you wanted with a train. And so parts of the country were being developed that bypassed the south and the south was no longer quite as necessary as before. Uh, for example, uh, in Texas, cattle drives, which used to go from the middle of the state all the way to Kansas City and Omaha, uh, no longer had to. They went to Wichita Falls and then they loaded the steers on trains and took them the rest of the way. It was much faster, it was much easier, it was cheaper, it was safer. They, it was a whole bunch better. And finally, there was a nostalgia, a yearning for the good old days of what it used to be like. There was, an, a, myth, there was a mythic America of the past, and people wanted to go back to that. That myth Amer mythic America did not include Italians, Greeks, Russians, Jews, Buddhists, any of these other foreign people. The mythic America was white and Protestant and somewhat Catholic. So the big question is, or was at least around 1900, how are we going to take America back from all of these insidious trends, from all of these evils that seem to be encroaching on our life? Or, to put it in a modern idiom, how can we make America great again? We've heard that. There are three ways that social scientists described America around this time. They talked about the earliest phase up through about the Civil War as Anglo-centrism. And the scientists that we talk about, the social scientists, were people like John Dewey and Horace Callan, who taught at the New School for Social Research. Now, Anglo-centrism is the idea that if you want to become a true American, you have to imitate people from the British Isles. And you need to speak English, and you need to adopt their culture and their style of life. As immigration increased, that concept was no longer tenable. And so what happened was they changed the idiom to a new concept called the melting pot. The melting pot was a very simple idea. You put all the people of America into one pot, you boil it up, and out pops an American, a new creature in the history of the world. Now, strangely, that new creature ended up looking pretty much like an Anglo. It was the same thing with a different style of language. But even that wasn't possible. And so around 1910 or 20, John Dewey and Horace Callan and their colleagues came up with the idea of cultural pluralism. And that's what we live with today. Cultural pluralism very simply is the idea that there are many different ways to be an American and that we are all connected by being sewn together, so to speak, as squares in a patchwork quilt. We share the covering of the country, but we each have our own distinctive style and culture and food and language and religion that we add to this country 
and the, the diversity is what makes us great. That's really the last phase. Now, opponents of that wanted to restore Anglocentrism. They wanted to go back to the good old days. And the way to do that, from their point of view, was to minimize the influx of undesirable immigrants. They wanted to staunch the flow of immigration. For Jews, this meant discrimination. Making life more difficult for Jews in this country, and that began sometime after the close of the Reconstruction period in 1877 and thereafter. The single most obvious turning point, if you will, was at the Grand Hotel in Saratoga Springs, New York. Now the Grand Hotel was a wonderful place for people from New York City to go and take the waters at the spa, watch the races, and have a little recreation and rest and clean air for a vacation. It was also a very elite establishment. And it was run by a man by the name of Judge Henry Hilton. Now, Joseph Seligman, a Jewish man, who had helped finance the Civil War, the Union side of the Civil War by selling bonds in Europe, decided to take his family to the Grand Hotel. And they showed up with a reservation and they were turned away. We do not cater to Jews. Go away. Selling, this was the first major incident of anti-Jewish discrimination. Seligman got even. He went back to New York and figured out how to undermine Hilton's possession of a store, a department store, which ultimately he bought. He fired Hilton and it turned out to be Wanamaker's department store. He got his revenge. Anti-Semitism was now out in the open and because Henry Hilton was a rather respected man in New York, it got a certain kind of respectability which it never had before. Colleges and universities began to express this in what was called a numerous clausus, a quota of admissions. How many Jewish people would be admitted to a new class? Harvard was especially prone to this under the presidency of James Conant, the president, but other schools also followed suit. Residential restrictions were common. We do not rent to undesirables. In 1908, the police commissioner of New York City, Theodore Bingham, said in a speech that alien Jews, by which he meant, of course, Russian Jewish immigrants, represented 25% of the population, but 50% of the criminals. He eventually retracted this slur under great pressure and was fired, but it was out there. And once you say something like this, you can never really take it back. Now, there were similar attacks on Catholics. They were Italians as there had been attacks on the Irish Catholics a generation before. The temperance movement grew rapidly because Protestant women believed 
that many of the evils of society were due to demon rum or bathtub gin, and that it was the Italians who were fostering all these bad things. They drank too much, and then they engaged in antisocial behavior. Similarly, on the West Coast, there was a push to drive Oriental immigrants, Asians, away. They were considered shifty. There was a whole science that developed, a pseudoscience called phrenology, where people looked at the bumps on people's heads and the shape of their noses and the cut of their chin, the color of their eyes and the size of their earlobes. And from these physical manifestations, they actually were able to make claims of character defects. Somebody with a chin that receded, oh, he was a dangerous person, couldn't be trusted. Somebody with a receding forehead, similarly. Somebody with squinted eyes, uh-oh, watch out, and so on. Now, there had been periodic attempts to limit immigration uh, over the years. The Immigration Act of 1917 during World War I was passed over a veto by w President Woodrow Wilson. But the post-World War I recession of 1920 and 1921 added immigration, added impetus to the anti-immigration drive. And so, in 1924, an Immigration Restriction Act was passed. There were two major sponsors. One was David Reed, who was a senator and a lawyer from Pennsylvania. And the other was Albert Johnson from the state of Washington. He was an editor with a long history of anti-labor and anti-immigration agitation. The major new position or provision of this law in 1924 was the provision of national origins quotas. Now what does that mean? It means that they allowed immigration into this country based on the percentage of the country that had come from a particular country in Europe or wherever. Up until that time, they had allowed relatively free immigration. Now they allowed only 2% of the population from each country. Now this was based on the 1890 census. And I want to draw your attention to the chart which is on the screen at this point. I have to tell you that when I did my d doctoral dissertation, it was in the area of historical demography, population. And so I have a sort of a fondness for numbers, and sometimes I get carried away with them. But here the, the numbers really do tell a story. Let's look at what the, this census did. I've taken 10 countries and divided them into two units. The top four are Western Europe, Ireland, Germany, France, and Great Britain. The bottom six are Eastern European and Mediterranean, Hungary, Lithuania, Russia, Italy, Poland, and Romania. Now, if you took 2% of the 1890 census, the numbers are in the first column. If you took 2% of the most recent census, the 1920 census, they're in the middle column. Now, they deliberately chose the 1890 census because that predated mass immigration. And let's look at the change that occurred. From the four Western European countries, the highest rate of increase would have been 119 percent and a little bit more than uh, doubling 
and then some. Germany stayed almost the same, and France and Great Britain, only about a half or a third of the original number. But now if you look at the impact of immigration, which is in the space between 1890 and 1920, the six countries from Eastern Europe and the Mediterranean, Hungary changed from 473 people to almost 11,000. That's an increase of 2,000%. Lithuania, almost 1,300%. Russia, 1,000%. And Romania, the smallest of the countries, was almost the same as the most populous country in the earlier group. In other words, by choosing which census to center on, the authors of this law, the Immigration Act of 1924, were able to artificially reduce the number of immigrants from certain places in the world and maximize the impact for other countries. Uh, they also set a maximum of 10,000 people per year. And the end result was that this was about, allowed in about 20% of the pre-World War I immigration. In other words, Emma Lazarus wrote, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. The golden door was now slammed shut. People had a much more difficult time getting in. This change had major consequences for Jewish identity. And that's what I want to end with, really. Until 1924, the Jewish community of the United States was very heavily conditioned by immigration and by immigrants. People were either immigrants themselves or they were children or perhaps grandchildren of immigrants. They brought with them a host of varied experiences and cultures. There were different rituals in the synagogue. If you came from Poland, you pronounced Hebrew differently than if you came from Berlin. And if you came from Romania, it was altogether different. How you celebrated the holidays what foods you ate, what other languages you might have spoken. Northern European immigrants spoke Yiddish. Mediterranean immigrants spoke Ladino <coughs> or Hebrew. There were ethnic foods. Sheriff Israel Congregation in New York, the Spanish Portuguese synagogue, at one point had a major argument about whether it was okay in a Sephardic synagogue to serve bagels and lox, smoked salmon, which are foods that come from Northern Europe. They're not, they're Ashkenazi foods, they thought. I think they resolved it in favor of gastronomic openness, but uh, that was uh, an indication of the kind of argument that was had people identified with the place that their ancestors had come from that they might have come from. So you could be a Litvak from R Lithuania. You could be a Deutsch, which is Deutsch mispronounced or repronounced from Germany. You could be a Polish or a Galicianer from parts of the what today is the Slovak Republic. Um, all different kinds of things. And of course, not only did they identify with these things, they created social institutions that went along with them. So there were synagogues where everybody came from the same background. Uh, s uh, groups of people with self-help societies, with clubs, with newspapers, with and and of course uh, the the most characteristic of all these societies 
was the Landsmannschaft, the, the society uh, for people of the same geographical background. And they would help each other. They contributed a little bit of money every month, uh, a quarter, a dollar, whatever they, the dues were. And uh, the result was that when they needed help, uh, they could appeal and a doctor would come or there was a dowry for a bride or somebody would visit the sick or they would help with a burial. Uh, they, they helped each other. There were residential enclaves that were based on uh, common geographical origins. People liked to stay in the same part of town where they had uh, friends who shared a common background. The Immigration Act of 1924 cut this off. It stopped this kind of ethnic identity. There were no longer large numbers of new immigrants arriving, although some continued. There was always some immigration but not anywhere near what it had been before the 1920s. The impact of this meant that the people who were here were going to be exposed to the same American culture over and over and over, and this had a homogenizing effect, a leveling of the differences between different groups. No longer could you count on new people from the old land bringing these same traditions. It was now the same folks hearing the same radio programs and eventually reading the same newspapers, traveling on the same streets, listening to the same political candidates, and eventually even listening to the same television. There were consistent efforts by the old guard, the people who had been here for 50 or 100 years, to Americanize these immigrants. That is to say, to make them as close to um, the model of what they understood to be an American as possible. There were English as second language classes. There were uh, classes in manners, how you ate at a, at a table properly. Um, efforts to cause them to adapt uh, to America. One of the things that happened is that young Jews began to run into each other from different communities and they fell in love. And whereas in the previous generation it had been a negative thing to intermarry with somebody from outside your own small circle, now people were crossing borders rather freely. And rather soon, it became irrelevant which community in Europe you came from. The acculturation was difficult. It was hard to figure out how to become American without simultaneously losing one's Jewish identity. And so we could speak of a new typology starting in the 1920s and 30s, and certainly in today's world. We can talk about the American Jew as somebody who has shared a common background in America and in our culture.